This episode of Tape Facts has been generated entirely by the by AI. What happened to my, my goddamn hands? Bonk! Scandium is the first member of the D-Block, a massive blob in the middle of the periodic table, taking up space like a fat rectangular schoolboy at the back of a bus. Most of the D-Block is taken up by a group of elements known as the Transition Metals, a group of shiny metals known for being good conductors of electricity, malleable, and forming coloured complexes in solution. Unfortunately, while every other element in the first row of the D-Block got invited to the Cool Kids Club, Scandium and its bigger brother Zinc didn't get the password to their secret treehouse. The D-orbitals of an atom can store five pairs of electrons, making for a total of ten, and what defines a transition metal is whether it forms one or more stable ions which have partially filled D-orbitals. Scandium has three valence electrons, two electrons in the 4s orbital and one electron in the 3d orbital. The only stable scandium ions are scandium plus, scandium 2 plus, and by far the most common, scandium 3 plus, all of which have empty, not partially filled, d orbitals. Now, this might sound like overly abstract quantum mechanical nonsense, well, partially because it is overly abstract quantum mechanical nonsense, but it has profound impacts on scandium's physical properties. Scandium's chemistry is far closer to the rare earth elements than the transition metals, which also tend to form plus three ions. Concentrated deposits of scandium are rare, and it's most frequently found as an impurity in uranium oxides. Scandium was discovered in 1879 by Lars Fredrik Nielsen, a mineralogist from Östergötland in Sweden. After being appointed a professor at the University University of Uppsala, Nilsson took an interest in the chemical composition of ores with names like euxenite and gadolinite, complex rare earth oxides with formulas that haunt the dreams of Scrabble players. Due to impurities in these compounds, Nilsson was able to extract a white powder, now known as scandium-3 oxide, whose atomic spectrum was completely different from any other material known to science. Nilsson christened his new element scandium after his homeland of Scandinavia, tightening the tyrannical rule of the Swedish over the periodic table. What's interesting about scandium's discovery is that it was one of the first elements to be predicted by Dmitry Mendeleev's periodic table, which he created less than 10 years before Nilsson published his findings. The periodic table of the early 1870s is a strange, primordial thing to behold. Sort of like the movie version of Sonic the Hedgehog before they got rid of his distressingly human teeth. If we take a closer look, we can see that there's not really a home for the D-block metals. They're either bunk bedding with one another in group A, three at a time, or awkwardly squidged into the columns of the main group. So you have manganese, a hard, brittle metal, in the same group as poisonous, highly reactive of gases like chlorine and fluorine. The F-block elements are incorrectly spaced and ordered due to some inaccurate measurements, with didymium, or as I like to call it, the peat best of the periodic table, later turning out to be an impure mix of praseodymium and neodymium. But the brilliant feature of Mendeleev's table, the feature that would cement his legacy as one of the greatest chemists in human history, is that he left gaps for future elements that he believed had yet to be discovered, with detailed predictions of their atomic weights and physical properties. One of these elements was the mysterious Eka boron, which Mendeleev predicted was a metal in between calcium and titanium with an atomic mass of 44. So when some Swedish randomo discovered a metallic element between calcium and titanium with an atomic mass within 2% of Mendeleev's prediction, you can imagine that it caused quite a stir. Now, even though Nilsson conclusively proved the existence of scandium in 1879, it wasn't until 1937 that pure scandium metal was extracted from its oxide, and it took until 1960 for more than a pound of it to be produced at a time. That's unit of measurement pounds, not money pounds. Scandium is extremely expensive to purify in large quantities, and outside of its lightness, it doesn't have many unique properties that set it apart from the other D-block elements. Scandium was thought to be basically useless for decades, but its fortunes took an upward turn in the 1970s, when it was discovered to be an excellent component in aluminium alloys. Even at ratios less than one part to 100, scandium can drastically increase aluminium strength and resistance to heat, with only a negligible increase in weight. The main usage of scandium alloys is for minor components in fighter jets, but they're also common in sports gear, like metal baseball bats and racing bikes. In general, metal bats are lighter and stronger than their traditional wooden counterparts. The bat part is completely hollow, which means the bat's centre of mass is closer to the handle. Because of this, the players need to exert less force to get a strong swing, making it exponentially easier to get a home run with a metal bat. They're also a fair bit cheaper than wooden bats in the long term, mostly because they're less likely to splinter. Metal bats are nearly universally used in Little League games over wooden bats, because American children generally don't have the muscle mass to swing wooden bats properly. Their bodies flabby and dough-like from a 
Lamarckian response to being shot by their classmates. Thing is, if kids use metal bats, why do the pros almost exclusively use glorified 2x4s? Two main reasons for this. One, the athletes of the 21st century are muscle-bound freaks, and are quite literally too good at their jobs for their own safety. With a single swing, Major League Baseball players can consistently send balls flying with exit velocities of over 90 miles an hour, the world record being 122.4 miles an hour by the Dominican player O'Neill Cruz. Keep in mind, this is with a heavy wooden bat under game conditions. If you gave these guys metal bats, it would be a massive safety hazard for both the players and the fans. And two, well, because the pros have always played with wooden bats, so a change in equipment would make it harder to compare stats. Yeah, can't forget about the stats, can we? Boiling down an elegant and complex game to a bland, monochrome slurry of fractions and decimal points, because God forbid we mess up someone's spreadsheet on the average player count of testicle polyps. So, yes, most professionals use baseball bats without any scandium in them whatsoever, which does rather throw my choice of thumbnail into question, but come on, what else was I going to use? A lacrosse stick? Yeah, bet that screams accessible content. The sport where they won't even let you on the pitch without four years at boarding school and a letter of recommendation from your dad's yacht club. 